Radio Shouty. What's happening? It's your boy Behind Radio Shouty. And stepping in the building, I got a super producer. I mean, I have to say, one of my favorite producers of all times. I mean, the conversation that I got to get into with you tonight, too. Word. I got to talk about some of these bops that then just got me through some things that you just didn't know, okay? <laughs> sure enough, that okay. helped to bring Beehive to where he is today. Awesome. But, hey, town, welcome. DJ Toop in this thing. What's good with it, Toop? What's up, man? I'm glad to be here, baby boy. Oh, man. How you doing? Hi. I love, love, you know, new spot set up and everything's great, man. Thank you, man. I'm in here just trying to make it do what it's supposed to. I mean, I couldn't do it big without having the legend himself in here. Now, Toomp, first of all, man, West Side was having (laughs) Southwest Atlanta too strong. You know I got to do it. (laughs) Now, Toomp, I done did a bunch of interviews, man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in each interview, I find remnants of DJ Toomp popping out of nowhere. Okay. Okay. I yeah. tried to talk to Raheem the Dream. Right. DJ Toomp popped out of nowhere. Kaya. I tried to talk to uh, MC Shadi. Peter Jones. DJ Toomp popped out of nowhere. Okay. You know, I tried to talk to, you know, Uncle Luke. We talking about the two live crew. DJ Toomp pops out of nowhere. Yeah, man. You know. Yeah, old Luther. DJ Nails for crying out loud. Yeah. DJ Toomp pops out Luther of nowhere. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on. Tump, can you take me back to day one when you was a teenager in the game, stepping out there with some turntables saying, you know what, I'm about to crank this thing up? Hey, man, honestly, you know, it started off with the pause button, man. What? You know, yeah. You know, I used to hear certain songs on the radio and you know, have a little cassette player. And I had this cool little cassette deck in the crib, man, that used to pause was just so accurate. You know? Yeah. Let it off on the one, on the two. So I started, you know, because I was pop locking and stuff. Me and Sleepy Brown, all yeah. of us used to be pop locking. I was like seventh grade around this time. And um, I understand, you know, I started understanding beat counts or whatnot. I still didn't know anything about production. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But um, I just started counting beats and listening to certain songs. And I was like, oh, what if it sounded if they would have stretched it this long? They made this breakdown go this long. Uh-huh. So I started playing around the pause button, you know, with the turntable, just moving the needle back. Yeah. And after a while, man, I started making mixtapes like that. Mm-hmm. And so when people were like, hey, man, you know, we want you to DJ our party. Yeah. I didn't have shit. No speakers, no turntables. But if you listen to this tape, yeah. you'll think that I had a whole setup. You know what I mean? My God. So I had to borrow one turntable. I had to borrow speakers. I used to have mismatched speakers and everything. I was doing house parties, man, seventh and eighth grade. What was that like coming up and being healed at that time, though, Tom, when you was mm. doing your thing and you looking up Raheem the Dream starting to take off and then you link up with him and y'all crank up booty shape? Because, see, that's what was messing with my mind, Tom. I was right. like, so you mean to tell me this man was in the middle of the whole booty shake era at the well, same time? Well, keeping it honest, Bihar, uh, believe it or not, it was. Um, it started at Jelly Beans. Okay. You know what I mean? Stone Road. Oh, yeah. There you yeah. go. From the Green Bar Skate Ring. Yeah. You know, the people on the Afro <laughs> painted on the building. But um, <laughs> with Raheem, uh, really, I won't even say the Booty Shake era hadn't even started. We speaking of 85, 86. What? So that was really just hip hop. We were kind of trying to do what New York was doing. Know, you know, like we did Eliminator and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, Raheem hollering about his DJ. That's when Houdini was talking about Grandmaster D and. Everybody, you know, Eric B and Rakim, so everybody was putting a DJ. Mm-hmm. So when he made that, when we made the song Raheem the Dream, that's why he put it in the whole verse. He's DJ Toompy, money he's earning. You know, Toompy was the nickname. <laughs> it took a while off as I got older. You know what I mean? But um, yeah, man, and um, we were kind of really just doing Southern hip hop at that point. Yeah. You know? And then later on, the Booty Shake came once I went down there and kicked it in Miami with Shadi and Luke and them. Play D and Magic Mike and the rest of them, and I brought that back up here. Break that down to me then, Tune. What was that like when you went down there to Miami and you got introduced to that bass scene? Man, I'm gonna tell you, man. Shout outs to definitely Peter Jones, Shy D, man, the first guy to ever take me out of Georgia. You know, I have a beautiful family, but yeah. we just never went on vacations, man. We never really <laughs> had like a real family reunion, not the David side. <laughs> but um, um, and first time ever getting on an airplane and everything. So it was crazy. Our first show was in California, and we were doing shows out there. And then finally, he was like, hey, man, we about to go to Florida. We about to work on the second album. Because, you know, he had got to be tough album out already. Mm-hmm. And um, we work, went down there to work on the Come and Correct album, me, him, and this guy, Mike Fresh. Yeah. And, um, man, just getting down there for the first time, seeing them women with them 
nice bottoms, <laughs> nice asses, man. I'm talking about no injections. These were just straight natural. We was like, yo, there's something in the water down here. My Miami. God. Yeah, and um, the clubs, man, everybody had the music sped up, like 140, 2 BPM. That was the pack jam. Another club called Strawberries. Another one called Inferno. Man, Inferno was like the Charles Disco of Miami. Mm -hmm. It can be a shootout Friday. It's still going to be packed Saturday night. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, all the all the D-boys would be in there. You see all their cars parked outside. It was back in Convertible Bird, all of them. Yeah. Know, man. It was it was crazy. So we talking about late 87 going into 88. Uh -huh. The album was called Come and Correct in 88. That's right. And, um... Yeah, man, just that whole experience, bro. I, I grew up fast. I was the youngest guy on the tour bus, you know what I mean? So you already know how that was, you know, touring with them. <laughs> you know, the Move Something tour, yep. uh, Band in the USA tour, yep. you know, it's a few of them, you know. So now, talk to me about New Jack City. Mm. What was that like when y'all had to put that song on that soundtrack? Dick in the dirt. Come well, on. I'm going to tell you, uh, it was funny because Luke, uh, he said, hey, y'all, I got something on the table. And around this time, I don't, I think Mr. Mix, Hobbs, he wasn't involved with it at that time. I don't know exactly what was going on. So he brought it to me, Mike Fresh and Cool Collie, you know, Cool uh -huh. Collie, Rodney Terry. Uh -huh. So we was called ODS, a production team. Uh -huh. And um, basically, you know, we had the whole idea like, hey, man, you know, we're going to get, get this beat together. We're going to throw some Scarface samples in here. So what I did was took this track from the Neville Brothers and put it in the SP-1200. I used Mr. Mix drum machine, actually, because it was just right on the spot. Like, you know, so I went through his crates and everything. And I sampled that joint. Do, 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 do. And we put all the Scarface and all the little sound effects in it, man, and put uh, Wong Wong and Marquise on it. Next thing you know, boom, man, it's on the New Jack City soundtrack. Okay, Toon, as a young man watching New Jack City, mm -hmm. When that damn song came on, yes, when, when, I knew that that song was touching me personally, yeah, and man, it was yeah, relatable. Yeah, I did not understand because this is a New York, it's New Jack City. Was in the Jeep, like, Yo, come on, listen, make oh, come D, on, man, you know, and yeah, 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 this crack, you know, yeah. And see, this is the type of stuff that I'm talking about, Toon. When you mm -hmm. find out that Toon was behind that, yeah. but you understand that sound, because to be honest with you. That was some trap music right there. Yeah, it was trap music. Come yeah, on. Had the Come on. Yeah, yeah. So, now when it got into the production <laughs> side of things, though, too, mm -hmm. what was it that made you say, you know what, I've been DJing, but it's time for me to start jamming? Really what made me, um, what really made me start taking uh, production seriously, believe it or not, it was even before the whole Shadi thing. It was I was still with Raheem, and that's when I ran into DJ Bobcat. Mm -hmm. He used to come down here and, you know, do love parties or whatnot, and um, one of the last times he came was around 86. He was like, yo, so, you know, this DJ and stuff is cool, but man, I'm getting ready to get into production. Yeah. He said, man, I'm working with LL Cool J. And, you know, come on, man. Yeah. I was a DJ, and I still want to be like LL. Like, everybody want to be like LL. <laughs> you know, that's the days Ladies when it was love cool. LL. Yeah, when it was cool to have a rap, your favorite rap on your wall. Facts. Now niggas think it's gay. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and it's sad, man, because you can't even be a true you can't fan even no more. My God. Yeah, that's sad, right? Yes. <laughs> Niggas yes. didn't let their pride get away the <laughs> of enjoying life. They don't even have in, in stores no more yeah. because so many niggas pride. Yeah. Yeah, finna go up there, nigga. yeah, it's your favorite rapper, so you don't want to get his autograph. Okay. My God. But anyway. Now I'm with you. So, and when Bobcat was like, yo, I'm about to get into production. And when I saw the Unbad video, when I saw him on the video mm -hmm. for the first time, and then I read the credits, produced by Bobcat, and, you know, I'm like, okay. L.A. Posse, and that's why I like, I'm getting ready to start taking this shit seriously. So instead of me putting money aside for a gold rope, <laughs> which I had that, I just wanted to get more, you know. I wanted the next picture that just looked crazy. That's and right. All the D-boys. Come on. You know, and um, and then I instead, man, I started saving up for a drum machine, man. And finally got me an SP-12, you know. In them early days, what was the first song that you felt really put you in the game, though, Put me Tom? in the game? Actually, man, um... And it ended up being the last song on that Come and Correct album, and that was Shake It by MC mm. Shad D. Okay. Yeah. Like Mike Mike Fresh, my man, he programmed the beat, but I came with all the whole thing. The cause, funk. Because I was still uh, learning the SP-12 at that point. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, yo, we finna get these drums from this BD, uh, B, BDP, Bridges Over. Yeah. Which yeah. we didn't know that that was Impeach the President. But it was just that boom, boom, cat, cat. <laughs> and I used to love the kick and that snare. Yeah. And so I'm like, instead of everybody using the regular 808 kick and snare, 
I wanted to put that bridges over mm -hmm. kicking scenario in the SP. And I was like, and I kept telling Shadi we need to do a song with a repetitive hook. Mm -hmm. That's why if you listen to that album, that's the only song on that song sound totally different from everything on the album. Because him and Mike, you know, we all produced it, but that was one where I was like, hey, I want to put these sounds in. This is how I want this song to sound. Exactly. You know, being the biggest song on the album. Shadi oh. actually didn't like that song at first. My girl, are you serious? <laughs> but everybody had that story about the biggest record exactly. in their career. Exactly. Snoop didn't like Jen and Juice, you know? <laughs> oh, nigga, please. Yeah. Talk to me about Atlanta at that time, though, Toon. Hmm. You're talking about the 90s, you being knee deep in the music industry at that time. What was this landscape like? maneuvering before it really just got cracking down here. Well, um, 80s and late 80s and 90s, I would say you had us. You had success and effect. Uh -huh. Raheem was still banging. Uh, that's when he started working with my man Red Money. Yeah. Um, Kilo came later. But it's, it's, it's like we were still trying to figure it out because we had Ichabon Records here, John mm -hmm. Abbey, you know, and uh, – JD had a, a deal over there. Yeah. He had uh, 69 boys, a few people. Yeah. So Ichabon was kind of like our, uh, hit, uh, not hit code, what was the name of that? Um, Macola. Uh -huh. You remember Macola Records? They, <laughs> they were distributing everybody from Egyptian <laughs> yeah. level. Selecto to, and. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. So we had that, that. So, yeah. And they were the, that was the label here. So we were still kind of grinding. We really didn't have no majors here. And yeah. I always say it, man, to this day, and a lot of people you know, who don't like to hear it, but I was like, man, if we had those same access to the labels the way that New York and L.A. had. It would have been over. We would have, this shit would have been in our hands a long, long time, time ago. ago. You saw what happened when LaFace set up shop down here. It's too much How talent. we took over, and that's when it started. Because exactly. a major actually came and sat, and that's what helped you know, Dallas, and that's what helped So So Definitely go to the next level is that boost from L.A. and facing them touching the city. You know exactly. what I mean? Exactly. Early 90s or whatnot. So, like I say, it always been talent here, man, but everybody was trying to figure it out. It was Everybody was in talent shows, and folks wanted it, man. You know, it was, it was everybody was trying to get it. Exactly. From the east side, west side. It wasn't just all, you know, everybody's like, oh, boy, that Camelton Road. I'm like, no, nah, it was a lot of talent on that east side, <laughs> no, too. No, that's true. Success and effect, shiny, yeah, yeah. damage, a long <laughs> list of them. You Come know what on. I mean? So, yeah, man, but... um. That, that's what it was like, man. Everybody was grinding, dude, trying to figure it out. I'm about to start jumping around to him because I got you in here, and I got to talk about here, my songs, okay? Okay. Rocco, What's the Odds? What's the Odds? That song right there, Tump, got me through some tough times in this industry, sure okay. Okay? okay? I mean, I wrote to that song on, I write to it on repeat to this day, to be honest with that's you. That's hard. The I don't organ. even have a copy of that one. Are you serious? And I need to put that in my discography. Yeah, I'll be <laughs> nah, about that that motherfucker. One. What's the <laughs> odds? You know, the chords on there and mm -hmm. the bass line on there is typical Tump sound. So you know what you're getting on there. It just got That's that right. bottom for you to be able to ride in the Chevy or whatever heavy car you're in. That's right. And you can enjoy your it's ride really and really car. get your mind right. Yeah. What was it like dropping that track? And then when Rocco came with them verses on that, did you understand what had happened man, there? Man, I really, it, it, it caught me off guard because, you know, to this day, man, I still would love to just kidnap Rocco <laughs> for about a week. <laughs> yeah. And just be like, hey, man, here go one, hit the booth. Mm -hmm. Here go another one, hit the booth. Even if we just have a seven-song EP yeah. and can feed the city that shit out, man, exactly. I'd be all right. It ain't got to be a whole that rock. Yeah. I would yeah. love to kidnap him right now. <laughs> yes, Rodney. <laughs> it'll be, it'll be, it'll, it'll shock the world, man. Um, but um, I wasn't expecting it. I, honestly, because, you know, as a producer, and not everybody tell you this story, man, we'll have our maybe top eight beats that we might put to the side. But like, yeah. yeah, boy, I bet you going to go crazy over this one. But that was the one of the ones I almost didn't play. What? And he was like, you know, yeah. If I'm telling you, everybody will tell you the story of, a, of an artist saying, hold on, go back to that, that one. one. Yeah. What was that? Whoa, whoa, what was that? Because I, I passed it. Exactly. And I, he was, I was like, you like that? And he heard it. He was like, oh. Next thing you know, about a week later, he said, yeah, I got that one. That's you know, a theme song. I love it. Yeah, the, the, the energy was right. It was perfect for that. I like that. Another song that goddamn big country came still fucking still country. country. Listen, man. So come on, man. Where the hell is Big Country? Oh my! It's when I heard that song. I haven't song. even seen that brother, man. I be looking for him, man. But yeah, that was a hard record, man. Still Country. 
I felt like you put a gun to that man's head and said, boy, you better go ahead and give it all you got hey, because man. this track is it. Let me tell you something about Big Country, man, keeping it 100. That man basically helped tip pick, pick out a lot of beats What in the early part because he would hear some shit that other people in the PSC didn't hear. Damn. Yeah, Heavy Chevys. That was Big Country's song. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Tip them jumped on it. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's a few records that Big Country had for me. That was hard, bro. And and the few beats where Tip, he had to tell Tip, like, hey, man, hold on. Y'all don't hear this one? Because I used to just get them niggas beat CDs. Come on. And, yeah, Country was definitely one of the ones, I, was the one out of PSC. Of course, Tip had a great ear. Yeah. But Country used to actually pick out some of them beats and be like, hey, man, y'all need to fuck with this one. Y'all need to hear this one again. And next thing you know, they get on it. End of A, I think, was one of them, too. Oh, my God. So now, <laughs> Tom, we talking about you changing the sound in Atlanta with Tip. Mm -hmm. And then y'all come through with y'all trap music. Mm -hmm. Dope Boys in the Trap, that's another one that's near and dear to my heart as well. Can you talk to me about when y'all got together to put together that I'm Serious album mm -hmm. and the funk that you brought on there, Tip? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, Tom, when I heard that stuff, it was a new day in the A. Right. Okay? Yes, sir. We was coming off of the Dungeon family doing their thing, yes, but sir. we had not heard anybody that represented the trap right? But at that time. Pierre Point Blank, we right. hadn't heard it. And nobody that could that can rap. Now, of course, we had Ghetto Mafia trapping right. and stuff like that beforehand, right. but I'm talking about going after Ghetto Mafia was over, going into that 2000s, that new generation was not being represented in yeah. the trap like that. Yeah, that's true. And when Tip got on them goddamn tracks and started... Spazzing. Yeah. What was going through your mind, Tom? Keeping it 100, you know, <clears throat> I still had one foot in the trap. Actually. Oh! Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I swear, you know, I used to, it's real. I used to get down with my exactly. old Exactly. You know I, I, mean? I know about and, it. And I remember playing one of uh, Tip's demos in the house, and my pop was like, what that boy? Who? Oh, whoa, he's like, he talking that talk. <laughs> I said, yeah, Pop, you talking that shit. <laughs> you know, and um, and I knew I couldn't just give him, um, and I always had certain tracks put to the side, certain samples, but I was like, man, who in Atlanta could get on these? Because I used to try to get on, you know, a look on the Dungeon Family stuff, but yeah. I kind of see that Rico and them had that tied up. They weren't hearing that. They weren't really letting <laughs> no other producers in there. <laughs> yeah, shit, man, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and which I respect that, of too. Of course. You know? um, and that's when I knew. I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to develop my own artists and, and just produce my own artists. And, man, by, um, my homeboy, too, who I used to hustle with. Yeah. And he was like, yo, you know, when you going to finally get my cousin to listen? Yeah. And he'd been telling me this for, like, months. And when I finally heard it, I was like, oh, yeah, dude got it. And all he was rapping about was dope and getting money, I swear. <laughs> And he got to the point where me and Toot were like, all right, Tip, man, you're going to have to rap about the brawls or something, man. Exactly. Like, but honestly, but he, he he talked it so good because, yeah. you know, he had his foot in it and his uncles and them were around, you know, a little bit older than me. Yeah. And they had been, you know, Quentin Man and they was getting money. Yeah. You know what I mean? That whole bankhead, they were, that was some, you know, them 80s, man. You remember yeah. them late 80s, man. Yeah. Yeah, JoJo, Lil Dave, and getting busy. a long list of cats who were millionaires <laughs> when they were like 19, 20. My God. So it's been Ferraris around yeah. Atlanta. Yeah. Wide body Mercedes, everything you saw in DuPont Registry. That was before BMF. Even Meech would tell you that. Come on. Come <laughs> so, on. Yeah, a lot of cats didn't think that started until then. So, like I say, that was a whole time, man, where it was so much going on. When everybody was, you know, had a few people that was in prison, but it was just so many people that ha hadn't gone to jail yet. Yeah. To where that energy, and it was just was nobody really talking about the trap and really talking about dope for real. And, and once um, we just started getting into it, man, we started doing these songs. We, matter of fact, it's like four songs me and Tip did. Neither one of them made the album, but it was hard. They still listen to them to this day. A song called VIP. Yeah. Stay Down. Uh, I think he's, he might still have a copy of those joints. I know Doug, DP, definitely yeah. got a copy of all the old Tip shit. Of course. Did. Yeah, Doug is the guy who keep all the old Facts. school shit. Facts. Um, but yeah, man, it, it was just a, a thing, man, where we... Um, we knew we was carving out a new lane. Um, I knew that I was carving out a new lane just by even introducing this youngs youngster to the city and to the world. Because, exactly. I mean, it was a lot of cats in the dungeon. Everybody can rap, but you could only pull one lyricist out of that whole dungeon. You know what I mean? Well, mm -hmm. you'll say, that's why everybody 
pull 3,000 out. I mean, yep. everybody can rap. Exactly. But when it comes to a lyricist, that's when everybody just be like, all right, 3,000. Mm -hmm. But once I heard Tip lyrics and just his detail, the way he was painting pictures, yeah. I was like, you know what? I, 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 I would be upset if nobody really hear this guy the way that I hear him. Exactly. Well, you know, I used to rap too. Yeah. And so I'm a hip hop head. <laughs> so you so know it. You know I'm a hip hop head. It. We talking about graffiti, pop locking, never learned to break dance, <laughs> DJing, <laughs> rapping, uh, everything under the roof. Okay. You know, of hip hop. And that's what I've done. You know, that's where I come from. So I know a good rap when I hear it, man. And I went, me and Jason, we went through a few artists before, we, before I brought Tip to the table. When you heard Tip, what was it about him that you said, you know what, we're going to settle with him and we believe that he can take this sound to the next level? What was his star quality that everybody else didn't have? Man, that Southern draw mm -hmm. with those detailed lyrics, man. Unpredictable flow. Mm -hmm. You could read his lyrics and say, oh, you might, he, which he didn't write, but if you was reading what he said on paper, you'll be like, okay, how is he going to put these words in here? Yeah. How is he going to do this? It ain't the regular old bouncing ball. Mm -hmm. He knew how to jump rope in between the beats, and that's that flow. Mm -hmm. You could teach certain artists that, or, some, or most of them have to actually have it on their own. You know, yeah. like, just like, you know, Megan Thee Stallion. She's a basic, real bouncing ball. Mm -hmm. But that's what everybody could compare her and Cardi B. See, Cardi B from New York, so she yeah. got that New York flow. Yeah. And Tip used to be in New York with mm. his old man. So, okay. So he okay. had some New York, Georgia <laughs> shit popping off. <laughs> so, I heard, like I say, the Southern draw, yeah. but he had that flow, the way he knew how to jump rope in between the beats. And that shit just outshined everybody who I was trying to work with at the time. When y'all dropped that I'm Serious, in Atlanta, we all went crazy because it was like, oh, my God, this is some new, real music to listen to from somebody in a new age group and generation. He was representing a whole new generation at that yes, time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What was going through your mind when it wasn't received well nationally, though? Man, honestly, <laughs> first thing that went through my mind is, okay, I wasn't even thinking promotion. I was like, oh, we can ready to make another album. Mm. I was ready for another album because I was like, I thought it was dope. Yeah. Tip, everybody felt it was dope. Come yeah. on, man. And we had Pharrell on that motherfucker. And uh, it was a fucking classic. Come on. Uh, Craig Love, uh, yeah. everybody's classic album. Um, Eight Ball, MJG, everybody. I, uh, was that trap music? Anyway, yeah. but. Uh, <laughs> trap music, music, we got to get, get into but, that too. But I'm serious. Yeah, honestly. And after a while, I, I started figuring out what it was because, you know, after, because um, me, I, honestly, you know, I was, at one point, I was just happy being on the producer level of it. Uh -huh. But um, when it started getting into the part where we started figuring out, all right, we may want to leave the face and go somewhere else, that's when I had to kind of get out of my producer bag for a minute and get back into it more of the the executive side, you know, mm. and that's when me and Tim and Jay started making trips to New York. Yeah. Figuring out, hey, man, let's take some meetings, man, because KP had done left the face. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the word was already swirling around that L.A. was about to dip. Damn. You know what I mean? So Tip was the last artist signed to the face, which was through KP. So he really didn't have any support. Yeah. He was like an orphan up there to a yeah. certain degree, you know, with no, no connection with anybody who signed him. And um, um, Mark Pitts, you know, he he hung in there. He wanted, to, you know, shout out to Mark. Yeah. He, he wanted he he we were ready to leave, but he tried to keep us up there. He was like, hey man, just give us another chance <laughs> or whatever, whatever. But he understood though. Yeah. You know, and um, and we we dipped, man. And once we um, we dipped, we knew we still had work to do until another deal came. And that way, we um, put out those underground mixtapes. Yeah. And Dope Boys on the Trap was the biggest one, and we did a little ghetto video to it. Shout out to Arnell Star, he ran it every weekend. My God, you know Arnell, that is my straight up inspiration right, right there. Man. Come on, inspiration, no man, man Arnell. You definitely can't talk about Southern hip hop or that him or Black Rabbi, man, like cats, you know. Exactly. But Arnell took what Black Rabbi had started to the next level with you know, American rap makers. Exactly. You know? That was really our TRL, that was Facts. our MTV. Come on, here, man, you know all mean? that kicking flavor every yeah, five minutes, flavor, man. Come yeah. on, that man, that's where I got it from, yes, Arnell. Sir. Yes, sir. So now, y'all are doing trap music, though. Mm -hmm. And I remember the buzz around that album before it even came out. Mm -hmm. Niggas was in the street saying that this album is about to fuck the world up. Yeah. 
What was it like putting those songs together? I'm talking about those well, Be Easies and all of those bangers. Well, what made the Trap Music album such a banger, man, believe it or not, is because we were able to put that first album out to get a chance to see what everybody wanted. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I'm serious. Was dope. Pussy Papa was dope. You know, Pharrell, he did his thing. Yeah. But we had a chance to really put it through the sifter and say, okay, this is what everybody leaning exactly. to. Exactly. And Dope Boys in the Trap end up, <clears throat> excuse me, being the biggest song on there. <laughs> yeah. So we know we need to lean to this trap To shit. the trap. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh. And we was able to grab, grab those elements and continue, you know, whole new label, Atlantic, you know, New Deal. Um, yeah. They gave us a crazy budget for the first video, which was 24s, which was mm. basically like the celebration of the whole I'm telling you, man, the ancestors, the universe, God, <laughs> whoever y'all can say is working, man, work. Showed up and, and showed man, out. Man, they showed out, man, because everything was just, it just went so perfect, man. Since, bro. For you, Toon, as a producer, what was your favorite time in the industry getting busy that you felt like, you know what, I'm just having my way out here? Uh, going and working on that trap music project because okay. we was getting interviewed from everywhere, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um... And you know, it was me and Tip now, we were more closer. Because yeah. I was really like the third party of Grand Hustle at that point. Mm -hmm. And a few things changed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, the way I was like, oh, I'm really not a part of Grand Hustle. <laughs> but I'm working with Grand Hustle. But around that time, I ain't gonna lie, it was it was great because I felt like, wow, all this time I've been wondering when I was gonna really just have my finger on the button, on the pulse, and somebody who I could really just say I developed it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so as a man answer me and this, as an artist, you know. I just got to go there then, to How do you deal with that, man, when you know that you heard that demo tape and then you see the label get formed without you? Oh, uh, it was heartbreaking for a minute. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because it, it got to the point where I'm like, all right, damn, do y'all remember? Because sometimes people have, you know, some people. Selective memory. Selective memory. And then you have some people who may not remember. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, come on, Jay, come on, Tip. You know, I'm not. I'm the one who introduced you guys. <laughs> I, I brought both of y'all under my wings and said, let's go. But we worked, like I say, we worked it out. Um, to this day, though, I would always say, you know, we, we, I made money with them, but we never truly to this day got money together. Yeah. You know what I mean? The, yeah. what, all the money I made with dealing with Tip, you know, with Grant Hustle and them was just really just. Producer money. Yeah, producer and. And Atlantic cutting the check yeah. because they were supposed to as a label. Yeah. But it's never a really, it wasn't no relationship like Will Smith and um and Jazzy, Jazzy Jeff. Yeah. You know, he's like, okay, yeah. I got a TV show, boom. Okay, yeah. Jeff is there. You know what I mean? Yeah. It just, you know, how did that way felt like I wasn't really a partner at the, after a while. I was like, okay, let me just that's when I start building Zone Boy. You know? How did that strain y'all relationship though, man? Because I mean, as a man, just having to deal with that kind of stuff, I mm -hmm. know it's got to be kind of sticky. Yeah. And then also as hood niggas, because I know how niggas talk behind closed doors. Those conversations ain't, hey, excuse me, man. I feel like I've been cut out of a deal. It's motherfucker, where my goddamn money at? Where my money at? Yeah. Come it, on. It, it, it was um it was crazy for a minute, man. You know, my manager had to, you know, I had to bring my management in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of slash business partner, one yeah. of my best friends, Bernard Parks. What up, though, Nod? Uh, Tommy Run is kicking ass right now. Yes, sir. We deliver building materials Woo. within same day or 24 hours. My God. Wish no one else could do that right come now. Come on. Come on. On that whole pattern. <laughs> so, um, um, but it took for him to really come in because I noticed, and I would love to definitely let a lot of producers know this, too, is... On a lot of situations, it really ain't us up, up, up for us to really. We can speak, but you got to get your management to really get folks to really understand. You know, a lot of times, cause you got to kind of let them be the bad guy to a certain degree. Yeah, and that's what real. You know, that's what it's really about. And I almost turned. I basically I almost turned to the bad guy <laughs> in that situation because come on, man, it's like come on, hey dude. But like I say, to this day, it's love. Me and Jay still talk at least. Twice a month. That's dope. I don't hardly to talk to Tip too tough. We all right. But, yeah. you know, we still, you know, we went to his birthday party or whatnot. It was cool. But um, a lot of times that just really, that, 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 when those situations happen to anything, whether it's a real estate or a owner of a restaurant, yeah. if you just feel that you were cut off, sometimes they just make you want to go out and start your own shit, you know? Exactly. And, you know, and, and, and that, that creates growth, actually. When we speak of growth, 
we got to talk about Kanye West. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, wait till I get my fucking money right. Another yeah, one yeah. of those songs. I mean, first of all, you know when Toomp done showed up because the bottom is in that track sure. and you can ride to that thing, yeah, okay? Man. So it's that sound. Okay, how about this? A lot of people say I made, made the South love Kanye. A lot of people say I'm responsible for Are the Are you going to let me do the interview? Are you going <laughs> to interview yourself? Because that's oh, what I was about, about to say. You about to say that, damn. Nigga, come on. I wasn't listening to no Kanye until you came with that shit. That's when I started man. listening to Kanye. I That's heard when it from you one of the realists, y'all. Man, come on. Wow. That's how you know a producer. I just told you with New Jack City, mm -hmm. that sound. I couldn't listen to no New York music right. back then at all. We right. just weren't even trying to hear that. Right. But I knew Digging the Dirt was one of them sounds. Now, first of all, I might only been like nine or ten years old at <laughs> yeah. the time, but I yeah. understood what I was hearing. <laughs> right. Now we got Kanye. When I hear Get My Money Right with the Jesus sample on there, I'm like, nigga. This damn Kanye be snapping. What was it like when you teamed up with him and got in there and gave that nigga some classic material? Yeah, well, oh, that was crazy, man. Um, well, let me see. Can't tell, tell me, me nothing. nothing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> said, same time. Come on. G. That started. Um, originally it was supposed to have been a remix to uh, "I Got Money," that the song I produced for Jeezy, what? With him and Tip. And Kanye was crazy about just the whole beats and the chord progression with the horns. Mm -hmm. He was like, hey, man, I want to do a remix to that. So yeah. you know, use your drums and whatnot. So he started putting some elements in it, him and Mike Dean, on the, on the, with my beat on the undertone. I was like, okay, only thing still missing is the low end and the other shit. And um, Jeezy wasn't too fond of what we did to it. <laughs> but he caught on later. You know, but yeah. I understand that because some things like, Shit, just like you know, certain outfits, you know, you might yeah. not respect it until you see it at a, on a runway or somebody yeah. rocking it the right way. Facts, you know what I mean. Facts. So that's the same thing with beats too. That's why yeah. you know, Ooh. you know, it happens. You know, you got to hear, hear how somebody else rock it. Oh. And that's why he came and blessed that damn remix the way he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? And yeah. his vocals were still in the original record. My God. So um, and that came together just from uh, from from that. And of course, I met Kanye when we was working on trap music. Also, what? Yeah, you know, he had like two, three songs on trap music. Yeah, Kanye, you know. Thanks. So, um, yeah, we was all at Patchworks working on that, and that's when um, uh, it's a club over there off Marietta Street, man. They used to have a, um, oil wrestling, women wrestling. Um, Body tap. Body tap. Okay, yeah. yeah. yeah okay, baby. Yeah, we say that. Yeah. And we basically <laughs> introduced him to the real Atlanta around that point, you know. Uh -huh. And that's when he started falling in love with Atlanta. We end up really, uh, like I say, we did most of the um, graduation album here. We started off at Doppler. First, we started off at my studio in the West End. Okay. And Ye was like, hey, man, you know, I want to invite some girls. There ain't enough room in this little room. I was like, all right, let's, you know, then we got Doppler. Then we end up finishing in New York. Mm. No, nah, can't tell me nothing, man. It was a masterpiece because when I knew that that song was something different is when he put that, when he said, because that was my first time actually using, sending files back and forth via email. Uh, I never had done that, none of that shit before. I was just used to being there, sending my files or whatnot, a CD or whatnot. But mm -hmm. um, when I heard that, oh, that was why I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and the effect on that woman's voice and shit, I was Ooh. like, yo. I don't know what the hell that is, but that shit fly. And I do all the bass line, and we just finished the whole joint up, man. Next thing you know. And that was the first one we worked on together. And then next thing you know, I started did, did Good Life. Mm -hmm. Then I did Big Brother. See, that's what I was going to go to next, Big oh, okay. Brother. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kanye got real deep on that song, man. Yeah. So, I mean, for you to be the producer behind that and then see him just, you know, tell it all about what he was going through, you know, with his mentor and Big Brother Jay-Z at the time. Yeah. What were you thinking about when you was witnessing that? Well, it was almost kind of remind me of what me and Tip was going through, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, and it was facts because um, and it was funny because I was actually we was finished we finished that up in New York, yeah, and was wild around that time when the um, when he first recorded it, uh, the word was floating around the office that hey man, Jay Z got a you know Ye got a song talking about Jay Z, mm. so when Jay heard the news, he was like. Well, is it good or bad? <laughs> and so I was there when Jay Z and Jay Brown came to uh, the studio just to hear it for the first time, man. Yeah, it's, it's video footage of that too, man. I don't know what dude's gonna do with it. What was you and thinking when you was in there, Tom? Like, damn, but I hope I ain't start no shit. You <laughs> <laughs> know, and uh, and then Jay was looking forward to working with me too. Yeah, which we end up. <laughs> you know, that'll come up later. Come on. And, um, 
And so it was funny, man, when he played it, you know, he got to the whole thing and, and him and Jay and Jay sitting there listening. And she's like, damn, man, that shit hard. And Jay Brown, you know, he'd say, yeah, I guess the negative shit he said about Jay Brown. And Jay Brown was on smoke. Yeah, that's how you feel, man. It was funny, you know what I mean? Real funny. But the whole vibe was right, man. I'm, I'm just, you know, glad I was able to uh, actually sit there and witness that whole thing, man. Yeah. You know, those, come on, man, we talking about some, some, the gods of the hip-hop game. Come on. I'm right there in the center of it. Good know? life, though, too. That was just a massive global fucking hit. Yeah. So, I mean, what was it like when y'all dropped that? And then when you were producing that, out of them three songs right there, did you feel like that was really going to change the trajectory of Kanye West's career in the South? Because at the end of the day, if you really want domination in this hip-hop game, you got to come to the South. You and you got to, you see what I'm saying? You oh, got man, to get boy, that. Talking my talk. So did you feel it? Because it... Niggas hate when I say that, man, boy, but it's real. Because at the end of the day, you can't hear that <laughs> shit, too. Yeah, I even don't tell nobody want to hear that New way. York shit. Out, yeah. And I don't mean it in a disrespectful way, but sometimes. Even they have to respect it. Like, shit, them break beats y'all were using in the 70s were Southern records. Come on. Come, Come on. on. <laughs> and in the South, I can't deal with my music sounding like noise in my ear. Sometimes right, right, I was right. hearing folks rapping over noise. And it was noise. like, okay, y'all, <laughs> you just rapping over noise. I can't even deal with yeah, this. You got a great ear. I Come on, it. man. <laughs> so when you hear somebody rapping over something with some flavor and some sauce on top of it, when you brought that sauce to Kanye and you saw how his career changed after that mm -hmm. and how he was embraced in the South after right. that. right. What did you think? But first, I got to go back to the good life because I didn't even talk to you about that and how big that was. Okay. So what was it like when you saw the good life hit and that thing just exploded? Oh, man. Well, that was my first Grammy Facts. as far as the statue. You know what I mean? Mm. I won a few before that, but the actual true statue, yeah, that came from good life. Mm. Um, it was the Michael Jackson sample, you know. Mm. Uh, he was chopping it up at first, but it kind of had that shot town feel yeah. to it. And he had it real slow. And so what I did was I was like, hey, man, I hear what you're doing. Give me that, and I time stretched it, put it in the Rolling Phantom, <laughs> and, and, and then I time stretched it in the Phantom, put it in the ASR, and hooked my MP up, and just reprogram it, and we just went from there. Had my man Craig King play the keys and whatnot, put the extra keys, additionals, and um, man, the magic was there. And everybody who came into the studio, we that was, that's one thing about yeah, he just loved just having an audience. Mm. You know, some people try to keep their album secretive and don't want nobody yeah. to hear nothing. Ye was like, no, nah, man, we finna get... Every night, it was a different crowd of people in that room he was playing the album to. And everybody was leaning towards good life. And the women mm. was crazy about it, you know? And that's what we knew, like, you know what? Even though I think Stronger was a single at that time mm -hmm. while we were working on good life. And we did, we knew it was going to be a big record. We just wait for the time. And so, Tom, just take me here. Mm. What is it like when you find yourself producer in these situations with these artists? Do you feel like this is going to be some paradigm shift in music that you end up creating, or are you just in there with your head now working and jamming, just doing what you do? Honestly, I'm doing what I do. And definitely as a visionary, I always try to figure out, hmm, where are we going? With yeah. This? Where this shit going? <laughs> and it's so hard to really just pinpoint certain ones. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, I knew K tell me. I knew all three of those. I knew I knew K tell me nothing in good life, but I knew Big Brother was gonna be a, a album song and not a big single because mm -hmm. it was so personal. Mm -hmm. But it was still the, the streets. You know, people that's their favorite song, one of their favorites. Um, but um, no, a lot of times, man, I just be doing what I do, B. Yeah, you know, and I don't really be knowing where most of them gonna go, man. I just. I just love just create that magic, man. And then I, you really don't know because the public is really who, who's going to let you know at the end of the day. Exactly. You know what I mean? We can sit around the speakers and turn that shit up loud. Oh, play it again. Turn it up <laughs> higher, man. Turn that shit up some more. <laughs> He's standing in front of the Osbergs, bobbing our head. He's thinking yeah. that's the first single. A lot of time niggas be wrong. You know, it'd be a whole nother record. Yeah. It could be five heads agreeing on the single. But boy, that, that, sometimes that don't be the one. And it just so happened, man. We end up having those singles. So, when you think about T.I. and Kanye mm -hmm. and being with them doing critical points in their career to kind of help them get over those humps to take them to that next level, mm -hmm. what do you think was the most significant thing that allowed them to be able to get to that next level? Um, 
As far as working with me? Yeah. And then just letting me mm-hmm. really produce. Yeah. You got some cats who will just make a beat and just slide the beat and don't have no input. Mm. Now I'm on it. I'm on I'm like, nah, you should say something else. You could say that. It's too many words. Mm-hmm. So a real producer, man, you know, like you got beat makers, you know, shout out to all the beat makers. <laughs> but then you got producers who can make the beat. Yeah. Who understands if this song need a singing melody. Who understands, hey, man, you're saying too many words. Oh, your verse is too long. You need to get back to the hook. I don't understand saying what you said right there. Mm-hmm. So there's a few things that I that plays a major part in the magic that you heard from me and Tip and everybody else. And 90% of the time it's because they really let me produce them. Some people don't like it. I say, hey, man, oh, that verse is all right, man. Do it over again. I don't like that shit. You can say something better. Even if it takes next week or another day. Mm-hmm. At the end of the day, you're going to be happy. You're going to be glad that I said that. So it's only really artists who really, truly let me produce them are the ones I can get that true magic from. But if I'm just sending files and you just getting all the stems and uh, I'm not there even for the mix or anything, Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just going to be a song by tune. When you got into that zone, that zone boy production, with that what you know about that and that Jesus, she love it. I love it. I love Mm -hmm. it. What was that like when those two songs hit and they just kind of changed the sound of where everything was going at that hey, man, time, too? You, you're a real DJ, because I could tell you about a chromosome for being a producer. Oh. Because <laughs> your ear, for you to put them together, because that's around the time when I started getting into horns and progression. Yeah, you was and, in a zone. Yeah, you could tell. Come zone. on, you could tell yeah, when the niggas in a zone. You got some shit over there at your house, too. You be fucking around. You need that motherfucker. I know you do. Because your ear, I can tell you, I'm telling you, I can tell you, you yeah. know that your shit. Yeah. So, um,. Hey man, I um when it came to that, that's when everybody was finger snapping, and you know, mm. you know, not to this, you know, but I was like, all right, you know, John got it, and we got Laffy Taffy and a few other, you know, you know, records like, you know, I wasn't really into the I respected it. Yeah. But I was like, I'm not getting ready to do those records. I'm always been an innovator. Even as a kid, I always yeah. do something totally different. Yeah, I see y'all going this way. Watch what happened when I go this exactly. way. Exactly. Next thing you know, I'm like, yeah, what took y'all so long? Ooh. <laughs> exactly. Then that dude. Come for a on. Long time. So, Come on. Um, with I was I just started getting into more of the music. Start digging deep into the crate. So, um, shoot, Roberta Flack, man, gone away. That's the song where I replayed. Mm-hmm. You know, we played the music, and I always have liked that song when I was a kid, especially the end part. Mm-hmm. Um, and shoot, man, end up making a whole track off of it. Uh, it's crazy because A Ball MJG had it. Ooh. Uh, Benzino and Baby had it. What? And Jeezy even had it, but that's when he caught strep throat. So he uh, wasn't able to deliver. But he yeah. was crazy about that damn track. <laughs> and um, it was wild, old Tip almost didn't catch it. He liked it. But he didn't ever finish it. It took for G. Robeson and uh, Gene to come to my studio and say, hey, man, didn't, uh, didn't Tip work on this one beat? I was like, yeah. They it, it said he didn't play it for them. But I ended up playing it. He was like, damn, why you didn't play it? I was like, I don't know. It ended up being the biggest song of our damn career. So <laughs> I don't know. He was trying to get his producers on and just didn't want to play the shit produced by a tune. But that, that song almost didn't. And it ended up being a you know, song for the ATL. Come so, on, man. So he put a hook to it but never finished it. But they never heard it. And they end up having – and I've, I almost gave the beat. Benzino and Baby almost got that beat, man, because it wasn't moving fast enough on Oh, my God. Man. As a producer, too, when you started to add the chord progressions in there, man, how did that change your style? It. Uh, I noticed when I saw everybody um, leaning towards, uh, yeah, leaning in my direction because mm. everybody wanted that flavor. Yeah, that's when yeah. I knew. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm bringing some more shit. You know, <laughs> I'm bringing some more shit. Now. I'd have changed it again. And the, to this day, I'm, I'm, I, I, I could create music. I, I got the gift to create music, but I still don't know music theory to this day. Mm. I just know what it's supposed to sound like. Yeah, you know what I mean. And I know how to play it. But like I say. Being trained, no. But um, that's when, at first, I, I was thinking, oh, that's too much music, man. Niggas yeah. just want beats. Nobody want no melody that's strong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And boom, like, what you know definitely proved that they did. And then once I, and like you say, Jeezy almost had that song. So 
I was like, you know what, let me give him something with that same feel, but with a little up-tempo, and boom, I love it. Da, 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 da. You know what I mean? My God. The horns and the whole strings and the pianos. Yeah. He uh, actually came and picked that beat. Like, I was going through beats. We was in the West End. That's my studio was over yeah. there. He was like, man, I'm about to pull over that OG. He pulled up. We just sat in there going through beats. I think he had got, uh, I got money too. But boy, when he heard that one, he was like, dude, don't play this for nobody else. He said, nigga, I got this one. <laughs> he started saying the hook. He hit me on my leg like, I love it. That's what he was saying. He didn't have the verses, but he just kept saying, I love it. He said, man, don't play this for nobody else. This is mine. My Bro. God. Yeah. That was Shakira hit me. Rest in peace, Shakira. It was like, yeah. hey, boy. You got one, boy. I'm telling you, nigga, you got one. That shit was crazy <laughs> as hell. But see, another track, though, Toomp, that has a sound that still hasn't been able to be replicated to this day, but was so distinctive and so funky and just so fine, mm. is that a You Don't Know Me track. You Don't Know Me. I still talk over the radio that on that motherfucker every Grammy weekend. Nomination. You know that, right? I that mean. Was, that was my very first nominate, Grammy nomination. Okay. Yeah. You Don't Know Me. When you made that track, what the hell was your mind space when you created that one? Ooh, wee, man. I was on Camelton Road, man, mm. right across from the old Crystals, man. Okay. That was my first studio. <laughs> yeah. I, I moved out of my mom's house and, <laughs> and took that studio up there, man. I um, It's crazy on some producer shit, man. I took one of my instrumentals, mm. sent it through this effect called the Orange Vocoder. It was uh -huh. on the old Pro Tools Digio One. Mm -hmm. And that shit morphed a whole two track beat into that and when I heard that shit I sampled it back into the ASR and made a new beat around it and that's when I started putting the strings and shit on it and just so I took a beat recycled it set it through an effect and built a whole new beat around it and yeah and that you have it you don't know me track and uh what's crazy the young bloods had it what uh who else had that beat a few people had it Cause you know, I, I, I used to I'll tell you my beat CDs. I duplicate a few of them joints and just hit everybody with. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, bro. Okay, now we got to take zone. it to Jay Z, American Gangster. Mm -hmm. What That's was that funny. like collaborating with Jay Z and saying, okay, I didn't work with Ye. I mean, I don't work with Tip. I don't work with Rod. I, I don't work with everybody. Now it's time to get in here with. Wow. The argue, uh, arguably the greatest of all time. What was that like? And did you feel any pressure when you got in there with him? Man, no. You know what? He he almost put some pressure on me, but it, <laughs> it wasn't. Because I done ran into Jay so many times, man. Yeah. He always said, you know, one day we'll get together. You know what I mean? One time my boy Big John took me through there and um, ran into him in Vegas. We just didn't see each other. You know, we always acknowledged because that's when we met. Uh, yeah. man, towards the, that's when he really remembered me from when we was working with Kanye. Mm. And and that's when he later on he was like, Hey man, you know, I don't know when, but we definitely gonna work together. Yeah. And, and what's funny about that American Gangster album is that's around the time when Jay Z was talking about retiring. Yeah. And so my homeboy, uh, Big John, who runs um Sony over there, you know, big time guy. Shout out to Big John Platt. He hit me and was like, you know, whispering on the phone, hey, hey man, Jay-Z about to do another album, uh, you know. This ain't got nothing to do with, you know, no budget or what, you know, just, he says, a budget there, but you're going to have to dig in your pocket, boy. I know you got money. Fly on up here. <laughs> you know, going to get your hotel. So I checked it to the Hudson. Yeah. And, um, me and my business partner, Bernard. Bernard. We went up there, um, man, and I had, actually, you go on YouTube, I'm, I, I, I made like five tracks for him, just to, that I, a top five that I knew. Yeah. I had a top five tracks, but I made one more, which mm -hmm. was that one. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, a lot of time that last one be that one, right? Yeah. That door closed. Exactly. That that one. And I was working on it and all the while, I was chopping up the samples. And I was like, you know what, man? It was funny, though, man. It's a backstory because Two Chains and Player Circle them had that same sample. What? And the song that they did to it, I was like, change, that's it, cool, but boy, that sample's so cold. <laughs> man, I swear, man, do not get mad if I use that motherfucker one day. That might be why change don't fuck me to this day. Because I definitely took that, that, that sample, and he, he knew it, because I kept on telling him. I said, hey, man, that sample cold as hell. I forgot who did it, they, they version. Mm -hmm. But I knew I was going to put my twist to it one day, the love we share. And I found mm. that album. I had it in the crate all the time. Yeah. And um, chopped it up. 
And so when I went out there, to, uh, we flew up to New York. When I got there, Jay was like, hey, man, I've been listening to tracks all day. Yeah. Who was that? It was him, uh, JD, Usher, No ID, L Rock, um, and his uh, engineer, you know what I mean? And so he's like, hey, man, you know, I don't want to hear no more than really like three beats. And I said, oh, shit. <laughs> this nigga playing like this today? Yeah. Like, <laughs> That's all. Like, boy, I got some shit. So yeah. The first one I played was something original. Because mm -hmm. I was like, man, let me try to get one with no samples. <laughs> you know, so I can own all the, the whole bag. For this month. Yeah. And he was like, yeah, that's cool. That's cool. But no, I was like, hey, man, you know, go and play that shit you been fucking with yesterday. Yeah. I said, all right, this got to be the one. And when I hit it, Guru looked at me and Jay started. <laughs> so how, do, how he responded with Timberland on that little yeah. video. And look, he started rapping to himself. About 15 minutes, man, he just turned, said, turn the mic on. And that boy went in there, and Sean Carter went in there and blessed that motherfucker. Oh, my God. He lit that song up, man, and J.D. did the hook. That's him. You know, say hello. Yeah. That's J.D. That's Where the Jermaine hell? Dupree. Why the hell? Why did he pop out of nowhere? Hey, man, he was there. <laughs> he was already working, because he worked on that album, too. Okay, okay. Yeah, he had two songs on American Gangster. Oh, so, my God. And that's when No ID and Air Rocks was signed under J.D.'s production company at that time. See? Yeah, no ID was under it was signed under Jay Z around that time. Out of all of your studio sessions, which one has been the one where you just knew that God had entered the room and it was going to fuck down, and whatever came out of that studio was going to be a hit? Graduation. Ooh, Kanye graduation. Yeah, out of magic, man. It was beautiful. Um, just with everybody who was coming through, just to even say hi. Like, yeah. I met so many people just working with him, and it was just beautiful working with him. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, when you a producer working with an artist slash producer, yeah. oh, it can't be nothing but magic. Facts. Because he gets almost everything that's in your playlist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's open to, okay, he might hear a sample and say, oh, shit, or I might hear a sample from him. And next thing you know, we building. Mm -hmm. So I actually had another one. Uh, um, with him and coming called I Done Did It All that didn't make mm. the album but that shit was hard damn it was hard <laughs> it would have been one of y'all favorites too so now as a OG vet when it comes to this production thing I got another question mm -hmm. what the fuck happens to those songs that never come out you mean to tell me they just go somewhere into a hard drive and never come out hey, ever man, it seems like it yeah like I got about five Nipsey records that's in this hard drive somewhere <laughs> What's his brother name? I can't think of his brother. I met him when Black, I was in LA. Black Sam. Black Sam. Listen, man, where is that hard drive, brother? Listen. <laughs> what? Yeah, I got some records. Yeah, Nipsey blessed about four or five of my instrumentals. What was Hell it like yeah. working with Nipsey, man? It was incredible. Super cool. And then with Mike and Keys, those are his main producers. Man, it was just great, man. Super cool dude, man. You know, his whole structure, everything was right. Young businessman, entrepreneur. He was on top of his shit. Just to see a kid at that age and really having that that vision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great, man. A young grown ass man. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, what the hell are those <laughs> unreleased joints? You're right. It's about eight tip right about man. It's about six Jeezy records. What? About six more tip records. Um, it was another version of uh, "Say Hello" that, that I had sent there too. It was a that sample, and it was another one with this hard ass beat to it. And um, man, I got another one with Jay Z and Rihanna that was super hard too. Now what hard. the hell? Hey man, you got to ask some people at Def Jam, dog. They own it. They own it. You know, so yeah. Cause I just don't understand that records, though. Man. So I mean, cause we getting older too. Yes, we getting older. So you mean to tell me that the, the audience are never get is Highest peak now. Come on. So why not? Come on. Because <clears throat> my whole thing has always been I hear about a lot of music that never makes it out. And I'm thinking to myself, so we just flushing this shit down the toilet? And I hope not. Because people need. I'm even, I even want to put an album together with all the unreleased stuff. I got about four Nas records that nobody heard. What? Yeah. I mean, talk about working with Nas, though. That was great. That was great. It was me, him, uh, Erica. Jay Electronica and Khalees, all of us was up in New York. Electric Lady Studios, just mm. owning the fuck out. Burning good, you know what I mean? Of course. Talking about aliens <laughs> and UFOs and planets. 
Just into our shit. Time you know, traveling was, and shit. Yeah, I was with the Galactic Pack around that time. <laughs> I felt at home with all them, man, because they was, all, you know, when I be getting into that shit, people be looking at me like, all right, so, man. You know, I'm like, man, y'all don't think that shit Come real? on. Like, man, come on. I got footage. Come on. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so um, yeah, that was dope, man. Nas, man, incredible artist, man. It, I was, it was, I was great working with him because... I had always been hearing that. They say Nas didn't really like laying vocals when anybody else was there besides his engineer. Yeah. And shit, we got a lot of stuff done right there, you know, on the spot. And he went in the booth like I wasn't there. Damn. It was dope, you know. On another tangent, though, Toon, as a producer and as a man that comes from the street and then having to juggle that industry the whole time, and then also just kind of flat out growing up in the industry. Mm -hmm. How did you maintain your sanity throughout it all? Because one of the things that I noticed about this music industry is that when you come from the streets where mm -hmm. certain rules apply, mm -hmm. but then you go into the industry where those same rules do not apply, but people are doing things that might have got them killed in the streets, yeah, and you yeah. sitting over here thinking to yourself, am I supposed to slap this nigga or walk yeah. out the room? It's How? a lot of things. Just, yeah, you're right. A lot of ethics and a lot exactly. of... Exactly. Just things to where, honestly, that's why it took a minute for um, me to really, it took a minute before you really saw me on any magazines or any interviews or whatnot because I was just, you know, I used to just be like this, <laughs> low key. Yeah, that's me, but uh, I was, Yeah, okay, you know, okay. You just had to push me to get in that You Don't Know Me video oh. when you say Tumpa's on the beat. If he would have said, <laughs> I, I'll keep on flossing, popping longer, Tumpa's on the beat. I wouldn't have been on that video. What? I was like, you know, then later on I started seeing how important it was to put yeah. your face out there. Yeah. And then, you know, my other foot was completely out of that side. Yeah. So it was kind of like, yeah, it might as well. But, yeah, it's, it's funny, man, when you when you balance them, man, a lot of stuff that yeah, wasn't cool to do. But, yeah, it's super cool to do now. <laughs> like, you know, you see cats on Instagram with a room full of money. Yeah. Like, hey, man. Like a dead body or <laughs> blow being in the room, exactly. just even that much money. You know, a few little stacks of cool. Exactly. You see a big pallet size. <laughs> like, bro, y'all don't put that on. You might as well call the IRS your goddamn man. self. Yeah, don't do that, brother. Even if they all dollar, they might be all dollar bills, but still, don't do that, man. And not just that's why you don't really see me with all that. Exactly. Man. <laughs> yeah, man, it's been a lot of times we had one nigga that had. A crazy exactly. amount of cash, but I ain't just, I'm not finna just take pictures with that shit, it's man. <laughs> oh, stop it. Please, gentlemen, don't do that. Don't Along do that. the way, to what were some of the biggest lessons that you learned? And what was a lesson that was hard for you to learn that you had to keep on learning over and over again until you got it right? Ooh, boy, you good. <laughs> you good. Let me see. One of the lessons I learned was uh, you definitely can't, um, people trying to this day and it's not working. You can't bring that street shit into this music industry, man. You got to leave that where it is, man. Yeah. You know? And um, the only street shit I say that ain't really street shit no more that that's, that runs, you know, um, parallel with the industry is, you know, the marijuana business. You know what yeah. I mean? So, you know, that, that go, they go hand in hand. But if you try to bring something else into it, it just don't work, man. It, it just it clashes. Mm -hmm. You know? When Snoop did Chronic, Dr. Dre, he was talking about, you know, the – higher grade of marijuana that's on the market now, and that changed the world, you know? Yeah. And the whole album was based around that. Yeah. But if they were talking about straight, like, cocaine and, <laughs> um, you know, if they got, you know, Snoop didn't even really get Crack. too much of the gang shit too much, you know? He, he People saw him wearing yeah. blue, but you didn't hear they didn't Snoop Holland Crip on none of yeah. those albums, you know what I mean? And, um, and you know, even though you got even a guy like Cube who grew up in a, Crip neighborhood, but you don't hear him saying that. You know, yeah. but he may rep, rep one of those, but he kept it out of that. So that's one thing I knew to keep a lot of that stuff out of there. Don't ever try to blend the two, you know, as far as like if you super hard, like um, like over there on that side, stay there and just treat this music industry, treat that as your way out of whatever you got going on. You know what I mean? But if you try to put both of them together, it, it's just always going to be a storm, you know. And um, um, like you say, it was a lot of things where, getting back to what you said earlier, certain things to where if a person cross you, yeah, in this world, you would handle it this way. But this way, over here, uh, I got to call my attorney. Yeah. You know? And it took a minute for me to feel like, oh, come fucking 
attorney, man. I know where that nigga stay. I can pull up. What you mean? That nigga owe me ten thousand more dollars. Though. He owe me five. You know, I didn't get my back in. Come on. Oh, I just put your attorney on it. No, nigga, it's studio right around the fucking corner. <laughs> Let's go get this. That don't mean it. you're gonna get it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And if you go about it that way, you're gonna fuck around and they're gonna get more than you. <laughs> exactly. Instead of you getting this five, now he's suing you for five hundred thousand. Ooh. Because you done did this shit the wrong way. So it could definitely so it's a lot of little just ethics and a lot of little things that I, I learned later on. I kinda learned that, honestly, at a young age, but I kind of forgot as I got Is over. that <laughs> But you coming into the game so damn young, though, Tom. Yes. See, I always ask people, was the industry everything that you expected it to be? But then with you coming in so damn young, you was kind of raised in it. So how yeah. do you feel like it impacted your life being raised in this game? Well, it, it definitely I, I it, it turned me into a real man fast. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um. So I always, believe it or not, be straight up, man, I was, even in middle school, I was keeping at least 250 to 300 a week. <laughs> Mixtapes, yeah. selling candy, yeah. uh, DJing parties. And, you know, even, yeah, if I say from eighth grade to, shit, high school, I was always, I just started making more money. I always kept me a nice little knot. <clears throat> but I was always good with, with money, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Average person might go to the mall and, Spend this much on some sneakers. If I go in the mall with a thousand dollars, I'm coming out with almost a thousand bags. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, and I, I'm always you know pretty smart with my bread or whatnot. And um, I don't know. I just understood. You know, just and, and there's a lot of respect. You know, you kind of got the oh another thing that people um, got caught up into too. You know, is uh, you got to just change your mentality. Just knowing in the entertainment business, you're gonna have to deal with all kind of people. You got something against gay people? Well, the guy who's signing your check most likely <laughs> is gay. And not saying he's going to be trying to come on to you, but uh -uh. That, if you see that man, all right, yeah, he wear more pink than the average guy, or he wears his pants a certain way. Let him live. All right, let him live. This guy, is, he's hes behind your promotion team. He's yeah. behind your whole shit. Don't say nothing slick. Is Watch what you say. I know you usually say, yeah, the <laughs> f No, you can't say those this words. This ain't time Don't for that. that. Yeah. Stop. So you, you kind of, kind of keep a lot of, you got to just understand, man, and 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 it it, it molds you into a, like I say, a businessman to where you start respecting everything around it instead of just keeping that same old mentality that you have. You're like, yeah. <clears throat> Believe me, this industry will turn you. It'll mature you fast. Exactly. Sometimes whether it's the good or sometimes it's the experience of the bad part of just getting effed around real bad. Got some who were hanging there, like myself, but you got some who, back in the days, man, I can name a gang of artists who was grinding around the time I was in Miami who decided just to get regular jobs and just go UPS or the airport and just say, F the industry, man, I'm good. I've done this. I don't want it no more. Hell, I was almost one of them niggas. <laughs> yeah. Because yeah. I was like, you know what, this is bullshit. When I came in here and I realized that it, because I came in as a grown-ass man. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got in here, you know, I'm setting my ways and I'm understanding how I'm living. And then I realized it was just something totally different than I damn expected. I said, you yeah. know what, this is bullshit. Yeah. But then the rewards are still greater than walking away. Yeah, man. You see what yeah, I'm you saying? You got to go ahead and see that shit through and just and you then when you to. look at it too, man, everybody gonna have a story of yeah. that little steep hill that they had to climb. If, if yeah. that don't exist, believe me, it's gonna be a steep hill. You going down fast? <laughs> it's got to be a grind somewhere. Everybody want to see you your rise to power. Exactly, People love that man. Exactly. You know? Lastly, Tom, mm -hmm. what else you got coming up? Are you still cooking up in here? Are you about to do Ooh, something else? What the hell's going boy, on around stay here? Cooking, boy. What's happening? Oh, that stove, that, that goddamn <laughs> boy, that stove, stay going. The oven and the stove. Yes, sir. Oh, I got a, a crazy joint on E40. What? It's about to come out. Uh, okay. Been working with Music Soul Child. We Ooh. got some crazy shit together. Yeah, I do R&B and rap. Yeah. I do all that shit. I ain't, I ain't like mad at music. that. I ain't mad um, at that. Got one on Rick Ross album. That's Ooh. crazy. Yeah. Um. Um. What else? Shoot, I got a TV show that's coming. The process, me, Kurt from Patchwork, and my what? cousin Trav. Oh, yeah. that's gonna be hard. Yeah, the process. Yeah. So we got all the what some up, of Kurt? your favorite producers on there. Yeah, with some of your favorite artists. We're gonna show the whole process of you know when it goes down um, in the studio when the artists pick beats and 
and uh, song gonna be available on iTunes like at the end of the show. Hell yeah, yeah. Crazy joint, oh, man. that's cold blooded. Yeah, man, I got a few things. Um, got a uh, um, some stuff on the market right now. A few kind of I, I can't even really talk about it because a few things going on, but it's a lot of uh, things, man. I got a lot of I got my hands in a lot. Of okay, shit, now let me know now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will tell you about it once. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's dope. But I got my hands on a lot, man. Still buying property. Yeah, you know what I mean, you know, um, buying more land. So I'm about to do some stuff on the acres in South Fulton. About to go crazy. Yeah, on come that. on, about to develop that. Ooh, so there's one house on the property with a whole lot of barns, but we talking about 20 more acres. That I I'm know, about to go crazy with so. My God. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a developer as a community, but I'm still trying to commercially. I still be thinking about doing this. Cause I want, I want to do a paintball park too. Yeah, yeah, in South Fort. And they need that. Yeah, need hell, that. hell, I still stay out there, nigga. We need that. Yeah, Fuck that. I thought about doing a, a four wheeler park, but uh, it, I would have to cut out down too many trees. Because them niggas be on them four wheelers up and down, butting it all damn yes. day long, and all I almost hit me a few things. By the fact, I see yeah. somebody to flip over. I thought he was dead, and I was like, my God, but he was alive, and oh, I was man, like, y'all. Back up, he done did it before. <laughs> All them niggas you see turn on them four wheels, that the four wheelers that fell. That's about their fifth time. Boy. Exactly. Yeah. Oh so, man, that's yeah, a lot, man. I got my hands in a lot, bro. Just staying busy. Got to keep going, and like I say, keep buying more earth, man. So the next super stupid check come, I already know what what piece of property I'm about to purchase right now. You know, that I'm looking at. Yeah. yeah. I can definitely dig it with two. Appreciate you coming through this thing, right, brother, man. It means man. a whole bunch to a me, real man. player, Thank you, man. Yeah, man. Thank you. And you know, whatever you want, it, want me again, because I know we only every day. We really just, uh, <laughs> exactly. yeah, we just scratched the surface. But oh nah, man, whatever. I right, know. Nah. More man, I love what you're doing, bro. Appreciate and, um, it, hey, man. Whatever I can do to help, and shit, let's go. Let me know. I'm here I'm for here it. For you. Two, be high radio, shout it. I holler at y'all in a minute, man. We gone, my man.